a live stream for Gulf Specimen Marine Lab, and today we're going to talk about a group of fish that are really, really tough little customers. And I do mean tough, and I mean little. <laughs> there uh, are two families of fish that we're going to concentrate on. One is called the killifish, and that's probably from the Dutch word for stream, which is kill and these are oftentimes freshwater or brackish water fish. They're small, virtually all of them are six inches or less in body length. And uh, they really tolerate amazing conditions. Some of them are found in very, very, very salty water. Some of them are found in really hot water. Some of them are found in, um, or in deep caverns and caves. Some of them are what we call ephemeral, in ephemeral water, which means like ponds or streams that dry up and their eggs are able to dry and then next time during the rainy season, the eggs hatch out again. Uh, most of these fish live two to three years, although some of them have lifespans that um, can be completely completed within six to eight months. So these are really interesting fish, and I'm going to give you some of the other common names that you may have heard. In the um, killifish group, you may have heard the term mummy chug. The killifish up around the eastern United States are often referred to as mama chugs. You may have heard the term puffish out in um, spring waters and some isolated uh, holes in the southwest. Uh, they use the term puffish and uh, that applies to some of those fish that are in the ephemeral waters where the water may dry up part of the year. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, some of them are referred to as minnows simply because they're small, even though they're not in the minnow family of fish. And one of the most common ones that we get around here is called the sheep's head minnow. And it's not a sheep's head. It's not like a baby sheep's head. That's what everybody thinks, which uh, sheep's head are a porgy and they get black and white bands and um, they're uh, eating fish and they like rocky uh, areas like boat ramps and around the bottom of docks and all that kind of stuff. But the she said minnow, and I'm going to point out, I have a male and a female here. This one is the male. I wish you could have seen him 30 minutes ago because he was really showing off beautifully because the male gets very bright colors during the breeding season, and it is the breeding season. They get orange on all of the fins. The tail, a half an hour ago, was orange with that black band. And they usually get some blue iridescence along the top of the head. And catching this guy for the live stream, he's gotten spooked and scared, and now he's, he's like, eh. Um, I think I'll just uh, have some more subdued colors and try and blend into the natural surroundings, even though he's not in a natural surrounding. Now, normally he would be trying to um, show off to this female. And you can see that she looks very similar She's got kind of a mottled banding pattern on the side. She's a little bit deeper bodied than he is, probably because she's carrying eggs. That would be my guess. And um, usually uh, the male will establish kind of a shallow nest in soft, muddy, or sandy substrate and he'll turn sideways to the females and show off all those pretty orange fins and all that blue iridescence. And that attracts the females to lay their eggs in this shallow depression. And he may even guard the eggs for a little bit and um, not usually till they hatch, but they'll get them covered up and, and uh, eventually those eggs 
will hatch out. But this little guy is very, very common in our area and he's been used a lot in research because these are estuarine fish and an estuary is an area where fresh water and salt water are mixing and they can tolerate really extreme um, conditions. I, I think people don't understand that a salt marsh oftentimes goes through a lot of extremes during the day. The tide is going to go out and so there are going to be areas that are very, very shallow. The tide is going to come in. Those areas may be four, five, six, seven feet deep later. The temperature is going to change. When the tide is out and the water is really shallow, the temperature goes up and uh, many fish just simply can't uh, handle those extreme changes in temperature. They also withstand extreme changes in salinity. They can go from like four or five parts per thousand after a big rainstorm to um, you, can, you can drop them right into water that's 28, 29, 30 parts per thousand salt and uh, they'll adjust and do just fine. They also have a remarkable ability to withstand pollution. And these have been used in research and some of the papers are just astounding. They withstand large concentrations of heavy metals. They withstand large concentrations of pesticides. They withstand large concentrations of agricultural runoff. And in some studies, they were 8,000 times more likely to survive those polluted um, conditions than other fish that might be found in that area. So when I say these guys are tough, I'm, I'm absolutely saying these are real survivors. Now, as you might have guessed, this family of fish and fish that are similar have uh, been used a lot in the aquarium trade. And because they're hardy and they live well, <laughs> look at him, he's all freaked out. He's like, get me out of here. <laughs> but he is showing a little bit more of his coloration. I think he sees the female over here in the other jar. And uh, he's going, I really want to get over there. But um, these these animals are amazingly uh, resilient and uh, they just have a tremendous um, uh, tolerance for really tough conditions. They can live in water that's almost zero parts per thousand oxygen and they can live in water that has a ton of oxygen. So um, it's just really uh, a very interesting group of fish, and they're an important food source for many of our game fishes, redfish, speckled trout, black drum. Um, they don't usually, uh, they aren't usually found in those areas where grouper are located, but grouper come inshore for a part of their lifetime, and I imagine that during that um, juvenile stage, they probably uh, feast on, on uh, young, little killifish and um, live bears, okay? Now there are two other killifish that are common in our area. This is one of them. This is called the marsh killifish. And this one is often sold for bait in um, bait shops in our area. And it's got these bands of color along the side and of course, they're found in salt marshes. And they usually are in small schools, both the sheep's head minnow, all these little killifish uh, are usually found in small schools. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture because I could not, I think we have some of these on site, but we, they are really tough to catch. <laughs> These are bull minnows, and these are the largest of the killifish in um, our area. 
they do get up to six inches. Some records show them as having seven inches of length and they get very round and fat and so they're um, excellent bait and so they oftentimes get sold as bait also. All of the small fishes in this group have this kind of rounded tail and a single dorsal fin, the fin on top. Like a lot of fish have two dorsal fins, one that's very spiny and one that's soft. But in the killifishes and in the live bearers, they just have this single dorsal fin. And this is just a picture of the marsh killifish. So this one is locally called a bull minnow. In some other areas, he's called a gulf minnow. or gulf killifish. Okay. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the other family, which we don't have any specimens of uh, right now, but we oftentimes do. And those are the live bearers. And uh, they're in the same order as the killifish. And once again, many of these are found in the aquarium trade and uh, are, are uh, bred all around the world. Now, the interesting thing about these is that the anal fin is modified. This is a male and he has this big showy fin on the top and he's showing some of this blue iridescence that uh, occurs in all of the members of this order. And the anal fin, which is right here, is modified into this little, it's actually a bony structure that's used as a penis and transfers the sperm into the body of the female. Now the females are, this is not a female, this is a different fish, but the females are very similar, but not as colorful and the upper fin, dorsal fin, is not as big as in this sail fin molly. But these are quite common in our, our salt marshes right here in Florida and throughout the northern Gulf. And of course, because he transfers the sperm into the body of the female, she gives birth to live young. That's another reason these fish have become a very important part of the aquarium trade. That you don't have to have little larval fish somewhere or eggs that you have to support uh, and have them hatch at some point in time. They give live birth and the young uh, have a little bit um, of a head start on most other fish where eggs are just, um, eggs and sperm are just uh, deposited in the surrounding water. Okay, this little fish this little fish is called the mosquito fish. And although all of these little killifish and live bearers have found, they found mosquito larvae and other insect larvae in the guts of all these fish, this fish is particularly known for its appetite for larval mosquitoes, the little wrigglers. That's what you look for in standing water in your yard you know, and you want to make sure you get rid of all of that. But this little fish would eat them up for you. And uh, it's been exported into many other parts of the world uh, because of its appetite for those little mosquito larvae. And um, it's easy to keep in captivity. There's been a lot of research done on this fish, just like it has been on some of these um, killifish. And um, they are also live bearers. Now, um, I'm, I've not been able to find out information on exactly how the eggs are transferred, whether or not they have a gonopodium, that's what we have in the sailfin molly, or not. Uh, some of these fish that are live bearers the uh, egg is shelled, but it's held inside the mother. 
and on some of them the egg is never given a shell and they attach directly to the body wall of the female and they get some nutrients from the bloodstream of the female in that way. But very, very interesting uh, small fish, inshore fish, common in our area and different types common in many, many parts of the world. It's a very important order of fishes and it's a very ancient order of fishes. So they have been around for a very long time. Do we have any questions, Allison? Uh, not right now, but I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, what do they eat? They eat usually, that's a really good question. Almost all of them uh, are carnivorous, meaning that they uh, are predators and they usually eat insect larvae or small crustaceans like copepods and amphipods. But many of the killifish, and we believe some of the live bears also eat algae, so that there is some plant material in their uh, diet. And that's thought to be particularly important uh, in developing the colors that we see in the males in um, uh, the breeding season. We know that some of them uh, actually feed on pollen that uh, falls on the surface of waters and that the pollen is rich in oils and pigments and stuff that may assist in their colorful phases. Do they have short or long lifespans? They all have a pretty short lifespan. The, the, most of them complete a lifespan in two to three years. Some of them in even shorter amounts of time. Some of them are, um, for a small fish, can get up to maybe 10 inches, but some of the smallest fish are in these two families. There's a killifish that's eight millimeters long at full maturity. So that's like not even a centimeter, not even as wide as your finger. So very, very tiny. All right, and that's all we have today. Thank okay. you for joining us, and thank yeah, you, Leslie. Thanks. Come visit us.